Thank you for that introduction. Thank you guys for coming to hear my talk today. Uh, like a, Caitlin mentioned, I'm going to be presenting on simulating failure for student success. And I want to thank my coworker and colleague, uh, Margaret, for helping with the uh, communication side of my research and a lot of the slide development. So I don't need to remind anyone here that infrastructure is in a state of chaos, but just to hone in on one example, we have Flint, Michigan, where uh, the news has shown tons and tons of reports of all the lead in the water, and that's coming from the corrosion of pipes over time. And so this situation is something that obviously needs addressed, and my work is looking at how to address it from the education standpoint. Unfortunately though, Flint, Michigan, it, it's a much broader issue than just corroding pipes. And there are people involved and funding involved, and this is something that engineering education doesn't traditionally discuss, and that's something that we want to address in the future. And so the other thing I want to draw out here is that Flint, Michigan isn't actually the only place where we're seeing corroding pipes and lead in the water as a result of the corrosion in pipes. It's a much broader systems level issue. And so you can see here are some of the cities with different water levels that actually have lead at higher levels than Flint, Michigan. Another to highlight would be uh, Pennsylvania and just another news source that's showing lots of lead in lots of cities water. And this is a reoccurring issue. It's a big thing that our civil engineers are going to have to address in the future. And so how do we prepare them to be able to face a world where they're not just designing the infrastructure of tomorrow, but they're inheriting the infrastructure from yesterday. And Wisconsin is another one to mention. So infrastructure problems are not as small as even just corrosion in pipes and people involved in the water systems. We're seeing lots of uh, different issues across the country, but some to highlight are in Los Angeles where we're seeing main breaks. And so this is beyond corroding pipes to the fact where the corroded pipes have seen their day and they're actually exploding. You see tons and tons of issues, but one of the samples I'm highlighting here is where one main break forced 200 million uh, and 20 million gallons of water to flood and damage the UCLA basketball court. And you're seeing students who are actually riding in some of the water of the student pavilion. Um, pipes bursting, cities blowing up quite literally because of uh, different main breaks. And here's a picture of some of the cars that were damaged in the UCLA flood. Here's a website, Los Angeles uh, Times is actually allowing students, uh, I mean not just students, allowing anyone to record leaking pipes or pipe breaks because it's such a prolific issue in the city of Los Angeles. Um, but main breaks are not just in Los Angeles. So again, this is a systems level problem that our students are going to have to address. And this is just the water main break clock where uh, throughout the North America people can mention where different mains are breaking. And this is more information showing on the different main leaks and water breaks associated in the city of Los Angeles that the data has been collected. And you're seeing at this point where uh, Los Angeles is being able to collect data on the expected financing that's going to be involved in how they're going to have to address the city's main break issues. And so you're seeing millions and billions of dollars mentioned, but like we're looking at how can we address this from the education side. So using the Colby learning theory, we can look at the Colby learning cycle to see where are we good in engineering education and where can we improve. Looking specifically in the bottom quadrant, you can see that abstract conceptualization is an essential component to student learning and transformative learning experience. So we have a lot of models in engineering, so we're pretty good and got a green check mark on that. Uh, active experimentation, we uh, have students engage in a lab, they're able to do stuff, and that's good. But where we're not necessarily performing as well is in the concrete experience. We cannot and repeat, should not have our civil engineering students in a real infrastructure system where they're allowed to learn and mess up because people would get hurt. So obviously that's an area where we can improve. And my work is focused on how can we create a simulated environment and a gaming approach to allow students to fail in a simulated experience that will help check off the experience component of transformative learning. Uh, along with that's the reflective observation. Without having that experience, it's hard to reflect on an experience you haven't had. So that's another thing that my work will address. 
And just to highlight again some of the infrastructure issues that are occurring across the U.S and how this is the area of infrastructure replacement. So when designing a simulation approach uh, for engineering intervention in education, I wanted to address specifically infrastructure challenges that students are uh, well averse to, but give them a perspective switch that will help them uh, reflect on their learning. So addressing how big this is a systems level problem and the monetary component of this problem, I want a little bit of engagement at this point in the conversation because there's one other part of the learning theory that I want to introduce. So I've looked at the lawyer, uh, the cold transform transformative learning process, but I want to take a cognitive psychology approach to the student's education as well and to overcome some of the heuristics that we think students might be running up against when they're developing the systems that we have. So, little question for you. If a bat and a ball uh, together cost a dollar and ten cents. How and if the baseball bat costs one dollar more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Ten cents. Okay. So some of you all are shaking your head. What what's the answer that you're thinking? The shaking the head group. I heard some ten cents. Five cents. Okay. We have an answer for five cents. So the issue with this is if the ball were ten cents and the bat is a dollar more, the bat itself would be a dollar and 10 cents. So it has to be five cents so that the doll, yeah, oh. Okay, but when I first flashed the slide up, let's stop for a second and think. When I first brought the slide up, how many of you were like, oh, this is a brain teaser? Like, how many just like red flags saw that and you're like, I don't wanna answer this question because I'm probably gonna get it wrong. <laughs> okay, what you've seen is you've actually developed a heuristic to account for the fact that you've seen lots of brain teasers in the course of your life. And so initially, your obvious and intuitive answer would have been 10 cents, super easy. However, through the course of your life, you've learned brain teasers usually prove you're wrong and that it wouldn't just be a dollar or 10 cents and whatnot. So we want students to be able to address in complex systems where you have emerging properties like our infrastructure that it's uh, relatively, it's similar to a brain teaser in the sense that we want them to know, oh, I'm dealing with a complex system that has emergent properties. My intuitions about how the system will engage with society and perform throughout the course of time may not be right. So I need to slow down and think about that. So that's just, again, dividing into your two areas of the cognitive psychology, looking at system one, which is where you're getting your intuitions from. It's fast and it's unconscious, it's automatic, it's your 10 cents response right off the bat. But system two is your slower cognitive. And that's what we want. We want students to have the heuristics to understand I'm in a complex system, a uh, red flag, it probably doesn't respond the way I might intuitively think it will. And so I'm gonna slow down and try to account for more factors than I would have elsewise. So to do this, we've developed the LA Water Game. And this is a simulation-based approach that gives students uh, the opportunity to engage with three key components. This, uh, the idea behind this game is not to be entirely accurate. It's to be the simplified, the most simplified uh, complex system that students have a relative level of understanding with so that they can acquire the systems level thinking skills that we've asked them to uh, approach. So they look at the funding and the public opinion and the pipe breaks for the city of LA. Students, initially engineers think that if I design a reliable water system, it will be paid for. Like that's the goal. The past three years of my civil engineering curriculum always taught me we design it well, people will pay for it, right? That's not how it works though, not when you look at the reality of the situation. So particularly in Los Angeles though, where we've seen um, legislation uh, imposed for different years where LA has brought down their property taxes over multiple pieces of legislation and over time. And that's because they had a large influx of people moving into the city of LA and so the taxes on those moving in was really high. And so the infrastructure would be provided for through the people moving in. That works until you're Los Angeles and you're virtually at capacity or maybe even beyond capacity and you no longer have a large uh, migrating population into your city. So you no longer have the funding that you had accounted for before. 
Um, so the LA Water Game looks at the pipes breaking and the consequences in Los Angeles. So those are just more news stories. I'll flash by quickly because there's a lot of damage going on. So the LA Water Game lets students look at those three factors that I told you were in a relationship relative to how to fund a system. So students are asked to be the water manager of the city of LA. So the Vensim model performs a simulation that uh, allows these three to interact. So over time though, regardless of how well you think you could play the game, your system starts to corrode, it starts to have pipes breaking, and you have to decide uh, how you're going to fund for those things. So students' intuition uh, proves initially wrong here because where they thought, good system, it'll pay for itself, that doesn't work, pipes are breaking. What happens to public opinion when you have pipes in your system like LA breaking? Public opinion obviously drops. But funny thing, when you have pipes breaking and there's chaos in the streets and flooding events, people will pay for it. So whereas your quality in the system went down and your public opinion has dropped, your funding for the system has increased. And so students are then put in this conflicting, non-intuitive situation where they have to deal with the I can't make people happy and pay for my system. What am I going to do? And so they're allowed to, uh, over their given five year interval, so you make a decision every five year, and every five years you get to change how much money you're allotting to fun, uh, funding maintenance, so the pink button, versus the fee change, um, and that's pretty much your tax percent, so how much you're charging the public. And then they get to interact with it. It's actually in a Vensin model, so I'm just showing you the non animated version that would look like this, except for it has to be coded in, so it looks more like that. And so up there at the top you see MS, that's where the maintenance button is, and then the fees changes up there as well, and they get to toggle those. Students get to, um, we've played it in a few classrooms, and we've broken the classrooms into three teams. So you get to work with an inheriting property, which I think is important for perspective switching. So students are put in team one, two, or three first team is assigned with the system and the first 25 years and they're asked to uh, fund the system and give it on unless they get fired. So every five years they get to a lot different decisions and the way you see you get fired is if your uh, quality of water drops below 25 or your public opinion drops below 25 because basically your public hates you and so you're outed as the water manager. Uh, then the next team rolls in. So the the thing that I think is really key about this is because in a typical way the game can play out, students uh, in the first 25 years have got a pretty good system. But by the third bracket of 25 years, those students are typically almost screwed from the get-go. And they're inheriting this system that hasn't been funded, they have no funding, the public already hates them, and what are they supposed to do about that? And I think that's key because our civil engineering students are not the ones who are designing entire new systems as a general rule nowadays. They're the ones who are inheriting it 75 years later. So some of the results uh, from the model, just so you have perspective of what the students are looking at, is you can see emergency costs, which obviously increase as times go on. Uh, funding, how the, if you're increasing at 2% and that's compounded annually, then funding goes up and obviously public opinion will drop with that. Um, more results, but I'm gonna jump ahead and just show uh, another key thing is with the quality. So let's say your students are the type where like, we're gonna fund maintenance, we're gonna fund it really well. They have to come face to face with the reality of the situation that is, even when I increase my maintenance funding from 80 to 343 as shown on the screen, it doesn't improve the quality of the system so much as it horizontally shifts the decay of the system. So you still have a system, it's still lead in pipes, it's going to corrode, it's going to break over time, and you have to start planning and accounting for this reality that the system will fail eventually. Uh, so that's one of the dilemmas that students face, how to manage public opinion, how to fund a system, and how to deal with the time inheritance properties of it. 
Some of the reflections that I think have been really beneficial in terms of discussions we've had with the students thereafter is how we will manage the system. So you give an engineer a problem, they love to solve it, and we've essentially switched the problem from uh, how do I design an engineered, well, reliable system to how do I fund this system I've already got? And that, uh, that switch, all of a sudden we get students giving new ideas of how they're going to fund this system. One student in particular came up with, well, if it's exploding water, chaos in the streets, it's drawing public attention to the infrastructure system and allowing it to be funded, then maybe we can approach maintenance from a disruptive standpoint. Maybe we have scheduled water outages where it's very inconvenient, it's like a roadblock, everybody knows it's happening, and it draws attention to the public of this is an infrastructure system, there are people who work on this, there's money required, it doesn't just turn on the tap by itself and it needs funding continuously. So that's just one of the solutions that a student approached and that showed the improvement in system thinking that the student was engaging with because they're seeing far beyond the perspective that they had beforehand where reliable systems pay for themselves, right? Future work, uh, we're implementing in different classrooms. We've been asked to uh, implement over at Ohio State. Uh, this was, has been tested at the Naval Postgraduate Academy with um, Dave Alderson's class this semester and he's invited us back to do it again in the fall uh, and uh, one of the groups and grants that I've been a part of is the City Network. It's a TOOS grant and collaborators that are developing an intro to infrastructure class. Uh, eventually we'd like to see this implemented in that intro to infrastructure class because we think you can engage more than just civil engineering students with this systems problem. So those are some of the different things that we want to work on in the future. Uh, thank you for listening to my talk and I'm welcoming questions. That's something I want to work on in the future is actually developing a more standard reflection process and essay prompts for the discussion as well as after the fact short essays. So I don't have results for you on that yet, but I'd love to do that in the future and have the answer to your question. Uh, go ahead. So uh, just as a, a little story, uh, where I used to live in Connecticut, uh, you to learn to look at a very effective method for encouraging maintenance and funding, which was every time something blew up, uh, everybody within maybe half a mile of that uh, main break got a letter, and the letter said, you can buy insurance from the utility um, because most of the time what was breaking was the feed line from the main to the house, okay. uh, which is very expensive, but it's on the homeowners, it's the homeowners' responsibility to fix it. So it was a way of really talking about the state of the system, but also a way for the utility to uh, have a financial edge so that they weren't on the line uh, for all of the main side maintenance that they had. So I'm curious about the, the in your model and in the classroom exercise, yeah. what kinds of uh, public awareness things can I as the you know, pretend uh, water manager do to influence public opinion besides just providing uh, reliable Definitely. I think that I'd like to see that play out in a couple ways. One, I see that as a reflective prompt question. So after they ex interact with their own experience and reflect on that, to the, this is how it's been done in other cities. What are your thoughts on that now that you've gone through this process? So I, I really value that insight. Thank you. I have a question in the same vein. How, because I saw if public opinion drops below or sees below 25, they get fired. How, how is public opinion measured in yeah, so the game again, I'm going to pull up. I was wondering how was public opinion measured in the game? Oh, because yeah. if it drops below or equals 25, they get fired. I just didn't know how that was assessed. And again, I'm going to uh, pull up the fact that the game is not accurate, it does not reflect reality, but it does reflect reality so much as the interaction between these three system components. So when we initially started designing and developing the systems game, it had a Vensim code that was far, far larger than the one you see here. It blew up across the page. And the issue with having a more accurate system that engages a lot more components is that it's more complicated versus complex. This is the simplest 
complex model we could establish with uh, parameters that people are uh, familiar with so that the complicatedness didn't convolute from the learning process. So no, it's not accurate. It is just this relative scale of public opinion being 100, public opinion being zero. And there's different ways we're looking at uh, plotting these. Well, I guess here we're just showing 60 to minus 60. So I'm wondering if there's a way to bring an L. So, so right now, to me, the game is very focused on the engineers who are going to fit the engineers. That makes sense. If part of the game is to help them have an embodied sense of what it's like to perhaps be a member of the public and have a little more empathy with the people who are being directly affected by this, it could be interesting. Maybe they're not always cast as engineers. Maybe there's other elements mm -hmm. of the game where they're cast as members of the public whose homes have been flooded or who, who are, have thousands oh, yeah. of dollars in damages. And there's some kind of role yeah. that helps, helps them, like, I'm cast as a member of the public. You're my water systems engineer. We're in class together. And I'm trying to convince you to do, you know, something like there's an interpersonal embodied sense that, okay, if you're a water systems engineer, you're in the field and a member of the public shows up at your office <laughs> trying to interact with you and get you. You know, to, mm -hmm. to do something, to, I don't know, so I think that could be a really, really cool, like, Definitely. immediate, simulated, like, role play. You know, I, mean, I think, think there's a lot where you actually had three people playing the game together. Right. Each person there's has different, a different, like, one of the different roles, yeah. one of the different stakeholders, yeah. and, they, really and cool. they have to interact with each other. But I'm also, I, I, I'm also, um, I didn't mean to throw it but <laughs> curious about um, how you see this game or do you see this game as being able to spark new and creative solutions on the part of these students? So part of this is understanding these various different component resources and component pieces that go into it. But then ultimately, I think what I'm assuming that what we're looking for is alternate solutions and different ways of approaching the problem. Definitely. And I love all the input I'm getting here. And I'm really actually enjoying the enthusiasm on the parts of you guys that are speaking up. Uh, we haven't played it out yet that way, but I'd love to see it done that way in the future. And yes, uh, why we want students to engage on a systems level, just even in their undergraduate education programs, is because we want to see new emerging solutions. And so my role in facilitating this game isn't to say what will or won't work on the solution side, it's to give them the opportunity to see a new perspective that will hopefully allow them to create better and new solutions. Oh, we'll wrap yeah, just on the, on the side of enthusiasm mm -hmm. uh, for this kind of simulation, what do you see as a possibility for actually influencing public opinion using a similar simulation, maybe more simplified, some kind of web page or mobile app, maybe even tied to reporting about systems problems or activated by them so that, uh, you know, they maybe they're not actually working on a system or thinking about complex systems, but it helps them understand the complexity at the, at the point of like anger and fear if lead or pipes explode or whatever, you know, so that it, so that this very kind of simulation can be interjected. Because as a communication person, I would think that this mm -hmm. would be so much more persuasive than like a sound bite or a meme or mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a poll result, you know what yes. I mean? To actually yes. be able to see, oh, yeah. You know, wow, you know, we're actually a part of this. Our anger fuels the funding for this system, yes. you know, and maybe that would start to change the, the patterns. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. And as we develop the game, I definitely want to, like we said, this is kind of like right now it's been focused on our engineering students because they're readily available and I'm an engineering myself. So I'd love to see it switch a little bit more up. One of the collaborations that I mentioned is the City Network and they're proposing not just one infrastructure class geared at engineers, but also an infrastructure, intro to infrastructure for society. Uh, that's based as a humanities credit, and that's a class I'm looking to teach in the future that would address some of the things you think that are bringing, being brought up by you guys right now. Thank you guys so much for your questions, and thank you. <laughs> so I love the enthusiasm of the discussion, and we have three speakers in this uh, session, so we're going to get through them in the allotted time frame, but I would love to open it up at the end uh, for more discussion, since you guys have a lot of really great input and a lot of good questions. So I do want to uh, encourage the continued conversation. Uh, but we'll move on to, uh, she's going to get all mic'd up and ready. Uh, but Margaret Hendricks, 
uh, we'll be doing a presentation on uh, teamwork and collaboration. So we look forward to hearing that. So we'll get her set up. She's going to impress us with her uh, heavy skills. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. When we talk about social, ecological, and technical approaches to solutions, I often find myself in the social realm, in the, in the blue part of the pyramid, of the, the three different pyramids here. And right now, when I listen to people talk about social elements of resilience, it's still focused on the people experiencing resilient systems and not the people studying resilient systems. And that's where I find myself becoming more and more interested in aspects of collaboration, because I often think sometimes we get so wrapped up in studying resilience that we forget the human beings who are the ones doing the studying and who are working together. And so that's why I think uh, being an IEEST is so amazing. We talked about this in the panel over lunch, thinking of it as a network of people who are really concerned and care about important problems facing society. So uh, these are just a couple snapshots from our conference already. This was the Resilience Summit yesterday. Tom Seeger led a session where we were trying to co-create definitions for modeling and simulation, what Lauren just presented on, and gaming. And so it was this very collaborative effort of people from all different disciplines and different ways of thinking about resilience to come together around concepts that are important to all of us. But it became pretty clear that we had some pretty different conceptualizations of what those words actually mean. And so if we're gonna start collaborating across disciplinary boundaries, we need to start thinking even in terms of our vocabulary. Because we know that words like sustainability and resilience are really complex. And as we heard, earlier in, in the conference, they don't belong to just one discipline, they belong to all of us because we all care about them. So today I'm going to be talking not as much about social and ecological and technical components of resilience or sustainability, but more about the people who study those things and who care about them. So I'm, I'm hoping some of what I'm going to be talking about resonates with people in the room. So this idea of working in networks and interdisciplinary networks in particular is not a new one, but last year, uh, this, uh, the National Academies released a report called Enhancing the Effectiveness of Team Science. It was a synthesis of years of research in business and management and organizational psychology, and they identified seven primary challenges facing interdisciplinary teams. And you can see, well, that's really small. Uh, it's goal alignment, permeable boundaries, large size, diversity of membership, geographic dispersion, task interdependence, and knowledge integration. And these are really important challenges to know which are facing interdisciplinary collaboration, and the report talks about each of them in depth. Like I said, pulls from business and management psychology to flesh them out, and it provides conclusions and recommendations for each. It's a really helpful resource. If I, I highly uh, recommend that you look it up if you work in interdisciplinary context. But as I read the report, I'm a human communication researcher. I use qualitative methods like interviewing and participant observation and ethnography, and more and more, I started to notice that the report is rightly very interested and concerned in how people collaborate and integrate and leverage each other's strengths. And it kind of looks into what these people think in terms of their, how they feel they are ready to collaborate, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But it doesn't really look at how they actually talk to each other, much less how they feel during those interactions. And so that's what I'm really interested in. What does it feel like to engage in interdisciplinary collaboration? We heard the passion of the people on stage during lunch and we've for those of you who have sat in on the Resilience Summit, it's clear that people are really committed and engaged in this line of work. And so we need to take these emotions into account when we're trying to figure out how to collaborate with people. So around issues of leadership, the report makes a couple of recommendations. These are good recommendations. I wanna include a disclaimer that we're not trying to disprove these recommendations. We're trying to build off of them. So in terms of determining team effectiveness, the report recommends a lot of pre and post assessment, being T1, T2. So in terms of uh, pre-assessment, they seek to assess someone's collaboration readiness through personal factors such as how they often work, their approach to research, as well as organizational and institutional factors which might 
limit or support them in regard to working across disciplinary contexts. So this is kind of a point A to point B. We look before and we look after through bibliometrics. Okay, this group was funded for five years. What's their citation and publication record after the fact? In terms of leading science teams, the pre predominant focus is on task management. Do we have the uh, skills? I'm not working anymore. Nope. Okay. All right. But what this does is it paints a very linear picture of collaboration. It's not as simple as point A to point B. There's a lot that goes on in between. We can't just look at where the river starts and look at where the river ends. There might be a lot of twists and turns in between. And so while bibliometrics are very valuable in a sense of we understand the breakthroughs and the findings of this particular network, we don't know what makes some networks more, more productive than others. We don't know what happens interpersonally along that line. So one of the recommendations that we make in the report is more real-time assessment, more ongoing iterative assessment, rather than just a once-a-year survey of, you know, how, do you, how are we doing, how do you think you're doing, but understanding communicative processes of teams on a day-to-day -day basis. How do people relate to each other? How do they communicate? We can't just look pre and post. We need to understand what happens in between. In terms of a task management approach to team assembly, it's right now the, the report What's happening with my pictures? Right now, the report is very uh, task going. Very task oriented. So I had a picture of a checklist here, but it's very much about okay. Do you know we have our requisite biologists? Do we have our ecologists? Do we have our electrical engineer? Do we have our material science engineer? It's very much trying to stack the deck in terms of skills, and that's really important. We need people on the team who have the the, the skills that we need to answer these really complex questions. But what this doesn't do is take into account the interpersonal skills of those people. Maybe someone is a, is a very smart, knowledgeable person, but maybe they like to work alone. Maybe they're not as good, as, collabor as good at collaborating with people across disciplinary boundaries. So to this end, we recommend more relational management. Yes, we need the task management, but we also need leaders who can engage in relational management. How do you manage a really diverse network of people who are highly engaged and committed to a particular problem? In terms of the last recommendation right now, Right now, uh, the report focuses a lot on motivating through tenure and promotion policies. We heard Gary Dirks talk about this a little bit yesterday. But the problem with tenure and promotion policies is that right now, they're not very equipped to think about people collaborating and co-authoring with people from other disciplines. Well, you know, you need to put a percentage on the amount of contributions that you made to that particular publication. Or, well, it might be more prestigious to work with people in one discipline than another. And right now, we don't have a lot of tenure and promotion policies that reward that kind of work. I know in my field, when you graduate, you establish a solo publication record for a long time to demonstrate that you can do this work, and so it might be several years before you feel comfortable or confident enough in your tenure track position or wherever you are to begin engaging and talking across disciplinary boundaries. So one of the recommendations that we make to build off of this, because yes, it's really important to understand how tenure and promotion affects people, particularly in academia and in institutions which have them, uh, but we also need to understand the individual's experience. It's not just about, am I going to get tenure? We're not all just in this came up in the resilience summit. It's not always just about money or prestige. It's about I'm doing something that I care about. And so one of the recommendations we make for leaders, again, in this relational line of thinking, is to really try and understand the desires and wants and needs of the people that you're leading. What do they want? Why do they care about this? We talked about the importance of personal stories in the resilience summit. Understanding where your team is coming from can help you better understand them and try and remove obstacles to their success as well as your own. So you might be thinking, well, these are some really great recommendations, but how do I actually do those things? So the next part is trying to start coming up with some practical implications for, yeah, okay, these sound like really great recommendations, but what do those look like in practice? How can I actually start doing some of those things? So in terms of the first recommendation of this iterative ongoing analysis is to begin understanding the value of communicative processes of organizing. Again, I'm a, an organizational communication doctoral student. We have a theoretical framework called the communicative constitution of organizations. And this framework argues that we can't just think of communication as a, a dial that we turn up or down when it comes to teamwork. Communication is teamwork. Teamwork is communication, collaboration is communication. That's the way it all happens. It's not just about I need to talk to you in a certain way. It's the fact that all of us here in the room are having a symbolic interaction that we're all going to 
implants in our memories and think about later. That's going to shape how we keep thinking about these things in the future. So this framework argues that it's micro, meso, and macro interactions that actually form the networks that, that we work in and that we collaborate through. We can also include social scientists as participant observers in teams and networks for this ongoing iterative understanding of what communication looks like. And STIR is a really great example of this. Eric Fisher, I don't know if any of you um, stepped on his poster last night. He's been working on socio-technical integration research for a while at ASU. And it's, the premise is this idea of embedding social scientists in these technical teams to be an understanding how they're relating to each other and trying to improve in that space. Uh, another potential option is, you know, if we can think about this far enough in advance, is to budget for ongoing qualitative assessment within grant proposals. Budget both financially and in terms of time. Because there's often a lag time in interdisciplinary collaboration. We know that it often might take a year or more for a team to begin gelling before they can really get into some of their research. So some options here, financially support a graduate assistant postdoc, or at Arizona State we have the University Office of Education and Evaluation Effectiveness, some mouthfuls, it's the UOEEE, but you might have one at your university. I didn't know we had one until I started working on a grant that they were included in some of the evaluation. Interview time and transcription, focus group time and transcription, there's pretty cost effective transcription services out there. Site visits for dispersed teams group workshops and team building exercises and face-to-face -face retreats. And these last two, um, if you're interested in reading a, a really, really great descriptive case study of the Resilience Alliance, this is John Parker and Ed Hackett's paper in the American Sociological Association, John Parker's a sociologist at Arizona State, Hot Spots and Hot Moments in Scientific Collaborations and Social Movements. And it traces a group, the Resilience Alliance, over the course of several years. They would have yearly, sometimes every nine or 10 months, retreats where the whole group would go to a third party location, often you know, an amazing tropical island somewhere, go figure, but they could bring their families, they could bring other people, and they would basically spend you know, a week or more just spending time around each other, getting to know each other, and using that as a context to think creatively about where they wanted to go with the project. And so that, you know, they, they talk through emotion and creativity and the implications of spending face-to-face -face time together and getting to know team members interpersonally and the value that that can have for creative ideas in this paper. So I highly recommend it. It's a really, really good read. In terms of having a more a relational approach to management, we pull from knowledge worker literature for some of these recommendations. So knowledge worker are people like scientists and engineers who work in these highly uncertain, innovative spaces. They're coming up with new ideas. They're creating new knowledge. They're not just using results someone has already found. They're trying to implement new things in new ways. And so we know that power hierarchies look different in knowledge creating firms than they do in traditional business firms. So in a knowledge creating firm, the capital is the knowledge worker. They're not just an employee to be managed, they're capital to be cultivated and to be integrated into the organization itself. And so one of the recommendations from knowledge worker literature is to include knowledge workers in the decision making process and to create measures for themselves. So this might be something like, what are our measures of productivity? Is it what the NSF tells us we should report every year? Or in addition to that, do we create our own measures that we decide on as a network or as a group? What would a productive annual meeting look like? I actually use this question in interviews for a, a, pro, a grant group that I'm working with now, and it reshaped how they approached their annual meeting. They hadn't thought to act, just ask, you know, they, the, the PIs had this idea in their head of, well, we need to accomplish these things. But until they actually asked the other people in the network, well, what would productive what would productive mean to you? What do you want to accomplish? It reshaped the agenda of that annual meeting. And people were a lot happier for it. They felt that they actually got to cover things that were really important to each of them. How will we know if we meet our goals and objectives this month or year? This might be a really different question for different people. I've asked people, well, what would a successful grant project look like? People have different answers. To some people, it's you know, high publications and citations. To some people, it's we get another grant. To some people, it's I get to collaborate and meet new people. So a lot of people have different ideas for what their own goals and objectives are. We need to be in integrating what the actual people who are doing the science think about and what they want in regard to their networks. Another finding from the knowledge worker literature, which you've probably guessed, is that um, in these interdisciplinary networks, the, the literature would recommend a much more horizontal structure or people allowing people to more um, kind of choose what they organize around. So maybe it's 
Now in a 100 person network, obviously there's gonna need to be some kind of, of structure, but maybe it means that people self-organize around concepts or questions that are interesting to them. Hey, we're gonna start doing lab work on you know, silver nanoparticles. Who's interested in that? Okay, let's organize a site visit and everybody who's interest interested in that can go do that. Or we're working on a different polymer, we'll do something else. So engaging in a more horizontal management structure is good for knowledge workers. Uh, lastly, in terms of trying to understand individual experiences, one of the recommendations is to try and create what we're calling, well, what Amy Edmondson calls psychologically safe spaces for team members, where people feel like they can actually express what it is that they want out of this network. And, uh, and again, I, I'm recognizing that there are institutional structures like tenure and promotion here, um, but the suggestions that we're making in the report are really on this more group, this, this local team and group level. So some of you may have heard of um, Joe and Michelle McCarthy's software for your head. One easy way that they recommend uh, to begin this more relational management is doing uh, what they call an emotional check-in. And people, um, it's very simple, it's just I wanna check in with you and people can say, they can pick from these four emotions. Are you mad, sad, glad, or afraid? And the, the conditions of this are that you can state your feelings without qualification, all emotions are valid, and you state feelings only as they pertain to yourself. And so it's a way, it's an easy way for leaders to just begin emotionally checking in with the people that are in their network and to try and understand affectively what's going on as well as cognitively. Now you might be thinking, well I know who my PEI is and there's no way he would be asking me questions like he or she would be asking me questions like this and that's okay. There's a lot of facilitation options. Maybe you hire someone, maybe you run a workshop where someone else comes in as a third party person and starts to try and create a workshop environment where people can open up and start talking about what they want. And if you're interested, so the psychologically safe um, term is one that Amy Edmonds, which is in a, from the Harvard Business School, has used for quite some time. So uh, future directions, so again, a lot of this is uh, conceptual arguments right now um, from some extensive review of ORCOM and knowledge worker literature as well as the report. So uh, begin thinking about horizontal versus vertical management structures, doing a study that might perhaps compare those two different leadership styles in interdisciplinary teams and networks and seeing if there truly is a difference. Um, trying to understand contexts where people can do emotional check-ins and better understand and tune in emotionally with the people in their networks. Uh, again, the socio-technical integration research out of ASU and Eric Fisher is also a different option if you're interested in that. Um, there's a lot of resources online. And then also this reframing of communication as constitutive rather than just a variable that we tweak in regards to collaboration. I just want to do a real quick shout out to uh, acknowledge funding for this research. Thank you. Open the floor for questions. Okay. I wonder if you find future studies and uh, if you wrote the <coughs> Sandy Pedman's work uh, on MIT. Sandy. Is P E N T L A N D? He's uh, written papers for the team science. Okay. He's the one with the sociometric badges. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm for, I read some of it. Are you saying like that could be an interesting study to include sociometric badges in looking at communication? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I asked the question about the simulation game. I think that that embodied sense, that would do that. It would get you to experience when someone is irate and they have things at stake and I have things at stake, how do I respond in that situation? I haven't yet. Um, but something we're talking about in our group is integrating things like uh, Lego Series Player improv communication. We've done some workshops to, to start building some of that up. But, um, but I did not see a lot of that in the report, which I thought was, was really fascinating because I think you need emotional intelligence when you're 
you're working around, you know, we talked about the political connotations of sustainability and the resilience summit when you're working around what are often politically charged topics and problems in areas of research, I think that's really important. I think anytime you put two people in the same space together, it's really important, right? Yeah. It's just it's, it's how we interact with the students. Right, right, because it's not just how much knowledge can I bring out of you, it's we need to begin forming a relationship if we're really going to work together. I think it's really important. I have a couple of resources for you too, so I'll um, yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And then our next speaker is uh, Stan Rodder, uh, Engineering Leadership. And we'll get him all mic'd up and ready to go. Are you guys monitoring the audio or? Yes. Just in case I... <coughs> so you'll be able to play my video? Yep. All right, well, I'm going to try and tell some, do some stories here. Uh, and uh, I don't have the results just like Andrew has. I'm, I'm just presenting uh, a curriculum um, and Claire just sent me a text message that we need more response to our survey, which was posted on the IST um, tweet stream, and we'll, we'll tweet it out again. So we're still uh, looking for more results on the survey end of it, uh, as opposed to our. Can you speak up a little? Hello. The, the mic isn't actually. It's not even your voice, it's only for the people online. Oh. So you need to speak up. Okay. So I start again, Lise? No, you're good. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I want to show a hands of people that have designed the product uh, in, in the room. Okay. And then keep your hands up. What about people that would like to design a product in the future? Okay, so we get some people here. That, that's great. So this basically represents uh, your cognitive dissonance being balanced with your rationalization. And uh, a lot of that science comes from Dan Arelli. But uh, I, I thought about this for, for this conference in terms of sustainability. I, I'm still fighting the Vietnam War and mutual assured destruction, but I did design battery chargers for Motorola, and they wanted me to destroy the batteries as opposed to like charging them too fast. So that is a you know one of the cognitive dissonance that I had. It's somewhat in the realm of sustainability because then they could sell more batteries and uh, be more of a human parasite to the earth. So I'd like to can you play this? This was a video taken by Patrick Remington. He's a great school friend of mine who's the Dean of uh, Epidemiology at the University of Wisconsin. And this was at the uh, American Health Association conference last year in Chicago. So you see the people going up the escalator, they're going to a talk, uh, take the stairs and to a healthy heart. The people that are going <laughs> on the stairs, they've already taken that, that talk. So th this graph is somewhat nebulous. I don't have any scale on it because uh, I, I think that the literature shows that when you first graduate, there is a large gap between your sustainability idealism and your practical knowledge. Especially if you've taken life cycle assessment, you want to go out and if you're an idealist, you're going to have some real issues. Uh, and I, and I, so you see the graph there, probably way up in, at the end of the graph is where I was designing the batteries uh, and charges from Motorola. So some people never get over that, that gap. And uh, this is just a classic cartoon that uh, shows all the different inputs that people have in designing a product. Uh, 
So sustainability is just part of that, that input. Now what we propose to do is to have students write an essay before they do their intern or co-op and use this uh, James Pennebaker's methodology. He's uh, more of a microanalysis of prono uh, using pronoun analysis uh, to look at your emotional state and mainly the, the use of more we's versus I's. Because I used to think that resilience was a better Orwellian word uh, it was closer to more we in uh, resilience uh, than sustainability until a professor at the University of Wisconsin told me, no, it, most people are going to be uh, just I, and it's them in New Orleans, I don't care about them. So even using the Orwellian word, uh, uh, resilience doesn't quite get us as far. Uh, this Diction 7 is by Rod Hart, and that's more for political scientists. The open uh, source Carnegie Mellon software, I, I propose that we eventually will have a pronoun analysis for sustainability. There's currently a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin who's using this uh, pronoun analysis to chart the, the uh, growth of, not the, the, the progress of Alzheimer's and Ronald Reagan. Uh, and you can use this uh, pronoun analysis to look at Ronald Reagan's speeches and see how the Alzheimer's progressed. And, and just an anecdote, uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, Tom Zinnan, uh, who runs Wednesday night at the lab, he and Tom, uh, Ronald Reagan are both from Dixon, Illinois, and uh, Tom Zinnan decided that he wanted to, to confront Ronald Reagan on the Panama Canal. Unfortunately for Tom Zinnan, he used the word Panamanian, and it immediately, this is probably about 1979, Ronald Reagan retorted, there were no Panamanians when we built the Panama Canal, that was part of Colombia. So he, was, he, he, he wasn't a very intelligent person, uh, that maybe some people don't realize. So this, this is Claire's side of trying to get me to, to look at the challenge and the evidence and, and the premise. Uh, we, we, ha we have to take a social responsibility for educating our students in sustainability uh, so that they become healthy citizens when they go in the workplace. We can't just have them drink the sustainability Kool-Aid and not be aware of the uh, arsenic that they're going to face in their life. So, what we intend to do is, is, is what I talked about earlier, is to have students uh, write uh, an essay before they go out, maybe showing their idealism, maybe not, and possibly a, uh, using a journal while they're co-op in and interning, and then reflecting afterwards uh, their uh, work as a co-op or intern student. So, this again is, is uh, stating that. So I, I hope to take questions and uh, solicit professors to, to implement uh, our uh, curriculum paradigm. more persuasive with sustainability. Do you want engineers coming out of school to be more persuasive? Well, I think that you, that you they, have, they have to have the leadership skills. I mean, uh, I, I said to Tom Seeger that, that he and I, we'd probably both be fired if we'd open our mouths on the first day of the job. Uh, so you, you, if you're that idealistic when you first come out, you have to have some leadership skills. And you can't have your students too indoctrinated uh, and, and understand that gap and give them the leadership skills that they're going to need. Uh, the example that I give is that from Bert Cohn that shows you how you can rationalize, and that is that he had a student who worked for Frito-Lay, and his student put 10% uh, 
whole wheat into a Frito-Lay product. You can Google that, and there is a, a probably in the 1990s, there was a Frito-Lay product that had 10% whole wheat. To me, that, that, that's like putting uh, 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 caffeine in a beverage alcohol, but that you, you, you want to moderate your use of it, but maybe I'm, I'm too much of a critic. But, but the incremental uh, approach of getting more whole wheat into that product is, is your rationalization site. And you have to do that when you get out in the real world. You're, you have to uh, climb the mountain one step at a time. Well, I think you have to be prepared for it. I, uh, if you if you truly believe uh, too much of this idealism when when you go out in the workforce, you won't be able to perform because that will be part of the cognitive dissonance. Well, ultimately, but, but I think that you still, uh, that, that's, you could look at it as, as cognitive therapy or uh, approach goals versus avoidance goals. That, as I think I said to you earlier, that, that we, we don't, I don't want to see a sustainability pharmaceutical pill. I'm not going to drug everybody with a sustainability pill so that they can be more altruistic. And what we have to do is to move to more we's as a way from the eyes. And that's one way of doing it is to use this for students to reflect on that. You have a question? Oh, absolutely, and but but not to get fired, you know, what? and not to get fired. Or get fired. Well, if okay. Are, if, if that's what needs to happen. If it's right. that, that, that. Um, and, and and I think and I think that those idealists. I mean, I, so I think that a lot of the changes that are happening in in the corporate world today are as a result of young people who have a different set of expectations and don't want to just follow. The following the pattern of I'm doing it because you told me so or whatever that is. So I think that I think the change happens because we were confronted with something that isn't okay, that isn't acceptable. And then for and then and that and that pushes our value boundaries. So well, I don't know if I would want to tampen down that idealism in young people who ultimately will be the ones that have the well, I, I maybe I'm, I'm a little on the pragmatic side that there, there's people that don't have discretionary income and large college loans, and uh, I, I would be reluctant to to have them get fired on their first job. I, I think that ideally that's okay, but they, you want people to repay their college loans. So I, uh, I I think there's some room in between. Literature search on that. There, there's, uh, there's, there, there hasn't been a journal, a journal uh, reporting for being on the job, but an education journal reporting is uh, is a big. Is a, there's a few papers. Um, I think that it's that there's a, there's a, if you do journal and uh, approach goals versus avoidance goals, you'll find some some work on that. Uh, I think that they're just going into that science, so it's a relatively new area.
Thank you so much, Dan. Okay.